When you're making a 3D print, such as these 3D test boats, which are the very famous boaty uh, test piece, the traditional method is to start off with a CAD program, something like Fusion, and do a design of your object, and then pass that to a slicer, which will take individual slices. Um, or if you don't want to use CAD, you might use something like Blender and create a 3D object for those who are more artistic and trying to build something a bit more artistic. Um, but all we're doing really is when you think about that tool chain is producing a data file of a collection of faces and vertices. So you could start thinking about other ways to make that file, which maybe use code and something more imaginative. I've talked before about my love of fractals on this channel and this going back 30 years to when my dad started showing me fractals on a very old 486 computer where we would wait hours for these things to, to render. Um, and I started about a year ago thinking about what would happen if you started projecting those into a three-dimensional plane. Last episode I started showing about how you can use uh, complex numbers in place of numbers in Python and actually quaternions in place of complex numbers. So you can take a fractal formula and just pass in another dimension into those formulas to start calculating points in three-dimensional space as to whether they're inside or outside a particular set. So the Mandelbrot set is the most famous. Um, and I started producing these complex plots saying are points inside or outside. For the past year or so, when I've had some spare time, I've gone down various rabbit holes on how to visualise this. And I always wanted to 3D print one. And when you think about that tool chain of saying design file into slicer, I realised that instead of me trying to make a design file of a 3D fractal, I could just create that programmatically and then um, inject that into uh, the slicer and then slice it. There was another option I did consider which was doing away with the slicer entirely and going from my points into just G-code. Um, but for the moment it's easier to send it to the slicer first because the slicer is doing some other things for me such as manipulating the plastic extrusion and temperatures all those things which I don't really want to do on my own just yet. So let's look at how we can first of all generate points and go from uh, points that we might have on a Mandelbrot set into an actual 3D model. So here's the source code, very similar to what I had in my last episode where I have my Mandelbrot formula here, coordinate times coordinate or coordinate squared plus a constant. And then I pass in a loop, say up until my limit, which I'm going to use a, a 25, I think, as my limit. Um, and what we then do is actually start this, this big loop here, which produces these slices of Mandelbrot. So each layer of this is a normal Mandelbrot. And then this is if, if you were just slightly above the base plane and so on. As you go up, you can see it starts slicing thinner and thinner and thinner. And the output from this is a whole bunch of points. On each point, though, I actually use Shapely to try and work out the boundary, the boundary points. Um, and the reason for that is I only actually want to limit the total number of points I then pass across to my mesh tooling. Um, my tool chain at this point, though, is to produce a... Um, I've got points, but I don't have any connection of how those are put together, which is where I want to use the ball grid algorithm to start doing that. OK, so the first thing we do is we start sampling individual elements uh, and we start asking the question, is this point inside or outside the object that we're looking at? Um, if you've got uh, a grid, you may just start sampling. So you sample this point here. You say, is this point inside? You say, yes, it is inside like a square around it and then we start sampling again we say is this point that's inside and maybe this point isn't and then we go again and this point isn't and this point isn't and so on so we start building up a grid uh, these are supposed to be equally spaced out um, using the formula whatever formula we have saying are these points inside or outside uh, sort of build up uh, an equal spaced uh, idea of the shape and what's important is that when we're sampling we are usually sampling at uniform width, but there's actually an infinite number of uh, points in between these two places. So we know the actual edge of whatever shape it is that we're sampling is something like this. Um, we don't know necessarily what that shape is, but if we wanted to, we could start subdividing this to try and work out where that line is. And this works really well for, or it works for objects where we don't know the formula of the line, but we are able to say, is this point definitely inside or outside? 
And that's what we're really doing with fractals, is we're sampling individual points and assigning a value to those points and saying if the value is over 25 or, or, or it's 7 or whatever, we're going to give it an individual colour. Um, but it's not perfect because the line very rarely is on one of the points and actually it's very rarely got an integer answer uh, in fractals. If you've got a shape like an apple though, so we've got some kind of uh, stem and then it's some kind of apple shape, you, these lines are very smooth. So when you're sampling going across, you get a very yes, no. And what we want to do is actually start building. Um, so if I start drawing some uh, points, this continues sort of down the page. All these points will be inside and all these points over here will be outside. So what we want to do is now try and work out what this line looks like from the outside. So when you've got a grid like this, you, you could just say, OK, well, I'm always going to join these points together uh, and, and say, well, these, these points here are the boundary line. But it gets a bit interesting when you get points like this or if you have um, a slightly better example, if I've got points um, like this, is this line here actually, is it this? Or should I have gone like that? I, I, what, what does this shape actually look like? Because I, if I don't actually know here, should I actually have gone in and out? Or do I shortcut that there? Um, there's some options, there's some interpretive options as to what you do. Um, one of the formulas that was invented for solving this is something called the ball algorithm. And it's a ball algorithm because it actually works at higher dimensions. So what you do there is if you have a collection of points, and I'm going to use that's a terrible colour. Let's, let's bring the, uh, the whites back. If I have a collection of points, uh, and these don't necessarily have to be uniformly spaced because uh, of weirdnesses that happen. Um, I've got a collection of points here which I think may or may not form the boundary. They may have some internal points as well. What you do now is you think about a circle coming and really the size, so I've got a cut mat here of my face. As the circle comes along, you start on one point and touch that point and rotate the circle around. And where the circle then touches a second point like there, you can then say those two points are connected. So because those two are touched, that is the two are connected like that. So that's the first line of my shape. As I bring this, this shape again forwards here and touch it, I sort of rotate it round, the next one touches that one, so my, my shape is there. And so on, as I bring this in here, and because I've got a very big circle as it comes, and the next one it's going to touch is actually that one there, and it forms the line like this, and I bring this circle in there, it's going to touch that one. And arguably, if that was the end, it actually rotates all the way round and see that actually, that if there weren't any more points at the top, that shape would then connect backwards. However, the size of this circle is really relevant. So if I now replace that circle with a much smaller circle, I'm just looking at my desk for, for a, a smaller cut mat here. Okay, As I bring that in, then that line's going to be the same. That line's going to be the same. But as I come in here, that line's actually the same. That's, that circle is, isn't quite small enough. I really should have planned this in advance. With, uh, this pencil sharpener here is even smaller. So as it comes in, it touches there and there. So that's the same that's then the same but this one as it comes in will actually touch there so you get this line difference as it comes in here that would touch there and you begin to get this line so the size of your circle over there would change the actual shape again if you've got a shape like an apple or a natural shape with natural curves this this circle method works really well because it actually has a smoothing effect on your points. So if you had a natural shape, you generally have quite smooth points. Um, and this you can then convert into your model. But if you've got a fractal with, in a fractal shape, this actually could be the shape. The shape could actually dive in here and come out again. And we see that in fractals where it could, it could have a shape like this and your smoothing effect dials it out. The reason it's called a ball grid algorithm is because actually this isn't just a two-dimensional. You can actually use it as a three-dimensional ball which comes in. It's better than using, for example, a stick. If you were to use a stick on this, you've got an arbitrary length of the stick. So as I bring that stick round, it would touch there. And as I bring it round again here, it actually could touch there. So if I have an infinitely long stick, you actually get the smallest bounding box which contains all the polygons. So if you just use a stick and where's the next point it touched? Oh, it's over there. Um, so a ball, a, a circle is better, it does have a less of a smoothing impact than a straight line does. So here we are, I'm going to in-point my big point array 
into this. It's basically a file. Each line is, is an XYZ spaced, no, no, nothing else in the line, just XYZ. When I import that in 1.6 megapipe file, shows you all these points that I've collected in these area. And you can see here there are some weirdnesses. When I look at this file here, I see these these elements here, which to me looks like there is uh, those little elements. But I, I do begin to wonder whether or not, like I don't know if you can see crazy, but there's some points there. And you can see it's an empty shell at the moment. But the question is, how do you now join these together into faces? Because you can't take a point cloud and just print each point. I could potentially make each point bigger and project like a circle at each point and then have those circles merge together and then print the object that it rotates from. Um, and that is actually how you can end up with some interesting shapes. Or I can begin to use the algorithms here to actually say I want to turn this into a hole. So MeshLab has some tools in it where you go filters. I can then do things like um, uh, remesh using surface ball pivoting, which I've just explained, and that will actually give you a shape. So you do ball pivoting, you give it some value in here, and it will begin to try and work out what that shape looks like. That in itself is just a whole bunch of faces which you still need to turn into a three-dimensional body. So you can then again in MeshLab or in other tools say, well, with those faces, I actually want to give each face a thickness. You say it's done it at this point without any simplification. It's, it's created all these individual faces. There are some floating ones, which are going to be interesting if you want to try and print it. There's also an awful lot of holes. Um, and that's because when you use, it's worked out the size of the board it should use for this sort of density of points, it's a particular size, but then it thinks there's big gaps where the object may be smoother, so it's created a lot, of, a lot of gaps in this. So you do need to actually simplify the object a little bit to get to a point it's printable. And from there, you then produce objects such as, um, and, and by taking these points in slices, we can then basically form the three-dimensional Mandelbrot. For different levels of ball grid, we form these these shapes, and we're obviously missing details. So this is a one with a slightly lower resolution than the second one that we printed. In the second one, when you put them side by side, they're obviously the same shape. And from above, you can see actually, if I do it this way around, you can see it's got the classic Mandelbrot shape in. The actual indent is inside here, so you don't see it because of that 3D effect. Um, but as it comes over what you begin to see is the actual individual rivets, whereas this one, those have been removed by that ball grid uh, effect here, has removed the, the, the extra detail by that smoothing effect. Um, so the resolution, number of points you get, and then the size of your ball grid that you use, then has a massive impact. And you have to do this to, to, to be able to print these 3D shapes. So these are um, 3D printed bandle bots, and they actually exist a, a 3D space like this. Um, and what I'm really interested in is, as you print these, is what they look like. Because I thought when I did these, they, these actually had almost like a, a crown type nodules coming up here, of little balls coming out. I'm not sure they do now. Now I've done a bit more thinking about the maths behind it. I'm not convinced they are. I think they may actually just be a projection all the way around, which, which means you could do a much higher resolution um, um, 2D slice and then just rotate it. But as a concept, these are quite hard to work out how to print because, in theory, the boundary edge just at one level is infinitely long. So straight away when you're printing one, you're making a simplification and you're shorting the actual distance you can move. Before you even start talking about the resolution of the thickness of the plastic that you're printing, these are um, complex objects to even consider printing. So this is my second... Well, actually, this is, this is about my... my 10th attempt at printing and something like, like you know, my 50th or 60th attempt at 3D modelling uh, via code, the, the three-dimensional Mandelbrot fractal. And that's what it would look like, just about at a, at a reasonable resolution. And then with 3D printing, this is the objects that come out. Um, they're wonderful um, objects. They are interesting you know, to me and they'll form a place on my wall. Um, I'm interested to now see what other fractals do in three-dimensional spaces, maybe ones which don't have such as a, a circular approach to, or don't have that formula about escaping a, a sphere. Um, but yeah, this is this has been a very interesting experiment so far, and I think that there are more places you could take this. 
Uh, if any of you people have any ideas about how I could improve this, how I could improve going especially from a point cloud to a three-dimensional model, I'd be really interested. I have had some help from people on Reddit uh, who pointed me at Mesh Lab and pointed me at the ball grid algorithms. Um, but I think part of the problem is the infinite aspects of the, of the shape cause some of those tooling to have problems because they're really designed for normal objects. If you used a laser scanner to scan a rabbit or a cup, ball grid algorithm would be very good at reconstructing the faces to make an object to be able to print and remake that object. I think when you have an object which has an infinite surface area, um, like the British coastline, it becomes very difficult to then translate that back. Uh, you're always going to have a level of simplification. So going from going from the simpler object uh, to the more complex object. I will just give a word of warning that anyone following this process, there's a lot of failure. There were a lot of objects that I got to which did not make it to the slicer. There were a lot of objects which in the slicer failed. And there were an awful lot of objects which failed to print. I probably, this is probably my sixth or seventh version of this uh, that attempted to print. But going backwards in steps, there were, you know, for every one I tried to print, there were 10 attempts to slice for every one of those. There was 10 models that went into the mesh uh, lab. And for every one of those, there were, there were uh, you know, 10 upstream of that and 10 upstream of that. So it took a lot of iterations to get to this point. And I'm very, very proud of this. I'm very, very cool for my first attempt. It, you can see the holes on the mesh I went for has come through. So there are holes, and that is not a failure to print that is a failure of the modelling side of it. So I think my 3D printing skill at the moment is okay. It, the issues around this are really in that modelling side. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, this is the current, as far as I am aware, current 3D model of a Mandelbrot to a particular mm -hmm. resolution at a particular a granularity or calculation as well. Um, so yeah, if you like this kind of thing, please hit like, please hit subscribe and I will see you in the next episode.